we'll now move on to the very important concept of micro attribution micro attribution now tries to segregate the performance of the portfolio manager and tries to answer why did the portfolio manager outperform if he did or why did he underperform if he did is it that he invested in the right sectors is it that he invested in the right stocks or was it a combination of both so we will first do the micro attribution for equity portfolios and then do it for fixed income portfolios so for equity micro attribution we'll understand it with the help of an example so let's assume that our benchmark had 50% of sector a and 50% of sector b within the benchmark there are two stocks so within sector a there is stock a1 and there is stock a2 that have a 25% weight and stock a2 has another 25% weight stock b or sector b has again two stocks that is b1 and b2 both having a 25% weight again my portfolio let's assume has a weight of or has a has a weight of 70% in sector a and it has a weight of 30% in sector b within the sector or within sector a i only have the stock a1 to which my weight is 70% and within sector b i only have the stock b1 to which my weight is 30% let's assume a1 went up by 20% a2 went up by 10% b1 went up by 50% and b2 went up by 20% such that the market on the whole would have gone up by 1 by 4th of 20 plus 10 plus 50 plus 20 because all stocks have the same weight so the benchmark on the whole went up by 25% whereas my portfolio would have gone up by 0.7 into 20% plus 0.3 into 50% and that is equal to 14 plus 15 that is 29% so my portfolio gave a return of 29% when the benchmark gave a return of 25% the value added return is calculated as the return on the portfolio minus the return on the benchmark in this case it would be 29 minus 25 that is equal to 4% so we can see that we have outperformed by 4% the objective now is to understand why this 4% happened the first component of micro equity attribution is pure sector allocation pure sector allocation says that how much of the outperformance came because of picking the right sectors or did we pick the right sectors so in this we have nothing to do with stock selection we will just see the weight of the sector j in our portfolio minus the weight of the sector j in the benchmark into whether that sector outperformed the benchmark or not so this is the return of that sector in the benchmark minus the return of the benchmark if we were in sectors that performed better than the benchmark our weight was higher 
the allocation effect will be positive. If we were overweight, sectors that performed well, this number will come out to be positive. If we were underweight, that is our weight was lesser than the benchmark. In stocks that performed lesser than the benchmark, again this effect will be positive. If we were overweight, a sector that performed lesser. Or if we were underweight, a sector that performed better, the effect will be negative. So remember, allocation effect is the weight of the sector in our portfolio minus the weight of the sector in the benchmark that is did we overweight or underweight a sector multiplied by the return that sector gave minus the return on the benchmark the return that the sector gave in the benchmark itself because right now we are only trying to understand our sector picks whether we pick the right stock in this sector we will come to later so for our portfolio, let's compute the pure sector allocation. There are two sectors. So for the first sector or sector A, the weight in the benchmark is 50% and the weight in the portfolio is 70%. So we are overweight to the extent of 20% or 0.2. Then is the question the sector A gave a return of 15% and sector B gave a return of 35%. It's the average of 20 and 10 and the average of 50 and 20. Does everybody understand this? That's the return on the sector. If you're invested in the same proportion, you would have gotten 15% return. If you're invested in this sector in the same proportion, you would have gotten a 35% return. So we overweighted sector A, which is a sector that incidentally underperformed. It gave a return of 15% while the benchmark as a whole has given a return of 25%. So was our sector picking correct? It wasn't, it can clearly be seen. We overweighted sector A. So from pure sector allocation of sector A, there will be a negative contribution. Similarly, for pure sector allocation of sector B, we can likewise, likewise calculate it. We put a weight of 0.3, whereas the weight in the benchmark was 0.5. So we underweighted the sector, which actually outperformed. It performed 35%, while the benchmark outperformed 25%. So from sector allocation, definitely our return is negative or we should have underperformed. Because of A, the underperformance or because of sector A, the underperformance should have been 2%. Because of B, the underperformance should have been another minus 2%. So from pure sector allocation, we should have underperformed by 4% because our sector picking definitely wasn't right. However, it may have happened that we picked the right, the wrong sectors, but fortunately we picked the right stocks in the wrong sector. So we picked the stocks that did very well, even though the sector on the whole didn't do well. So the second term or the second attribution that we'll study is the within sector selection. That is within the sector, did we pick the right stock or not? So within sector selection is calculated as the weight in the benchmark multiplied by the return of that sector in our portfolio minus the return of that sector in the benchmark. If the return of the sector in our portfolio is higher than the return of the sector in the benchmark, that means our stock selection was good. If the return of the sector in our portfolio was lower than the return of the <coughs> sector in the benchmark, that means our stock selection was bad. So let's see that in our portfolio, sector allocation has given minus 4%.
how much return has stock selection given or taken away so the weight will be as in the benchmark that is plus 0.5 that is the weight of sector a so again we'll first do it for a and then similarly do it for b so the return from the sector in our portfolio would have been 20 percent because our portfolio only had stock a1 whereas the return from the sector in the benchmark is 15 percent so we may not have picked the right sector but we've definitely picked the right stock in the wrong sector so at least sector allocation or other within sector selection or stock selection from a has given us some additional return similarly for sector b the weight in the benchmark is 50 percent and we have given a return of 50 percent because we only have b1 so the return of this sector in our portfolio is 50 percent just the sector and this sector in the benchmark has given a return of 35 percent so from pure stock selection we can say that we generated a return of 0.5 into 5 2.5 percent plus 0.5 into 15 that is 7.5 so 2.5 plus 7.5 would be 10 percent so 10 percent is the return that we got from stock selection only or pure stock selection because we picked better stocks the reason we take only the benchmark weight here please understand is because of the objective our objective is to only judge how much you earned or how much you earned because of stock selection you don't want to have anything to do with whether you overweighted that sector or you underweighted that sector hence our weights in the sector can be any for the purpose that we are doing this we don't want to use those because if we use 0.7 then we are placing a higher weight some amount of sector allocation bias will also come in if we multiply it with the benchmark weights then can you say the return is true stock selection or only stock selection because different portfolio managers may have different sectoral weights but when calculating the stock selection i am using the same for all i am using the benchmark weight so this return is purely from stock selection just like the return earlier was purely from sector allocation when we do this we will realize that some part of the value added return is still unexplained so if we see minus 4 plus 10 that comes out to be 6 percent whereas the actual value added return is 4 percent that difference normally is not a very high number is called allocation selection interaction that is it is not as simple the attribution is not as simple as simply bifurcating selection and simply bifurcating allocation there will be some allocation selection interaction because if a stock outperforms and we had a higher weight on that stock then that's a good thing because the stock has outperformed also we had a higher weight also so this some unexplained amount would be attributable to allocation selection interaction calculated as the weight of the portfolio or weight of the sector in the portfolio minus weight of the sector in the benchmark multiplied by return of the sector on the portfolio minus the return of the sector in the benchmark so let's compute the allocation selection interaction it was for sector a weight on the portfolio was 0.7 weight in the benchmark was 
पॉइंट फाइव रिटर्न ऑफ द सेक्टर इन द पोर्टफोलियो वॉज पॉइंट सेवन राधर पॉइंट टू और ट्वेंटी परसेंट माइनस रिटर्न ऑन द सेक्टर इन द बेंच मार्क वॉज फिफ्टीन परसेंट दिस फॉर ए फॉर बी दिस विल कम आउट टू बी पॉइंट थ्री माइनस पॉइंट फाइव multiplied by the return on the sector in the benchmark or uh, in in the portfolio was 50% minus the return of the sector in the benchmark was 35% so the allocation selection interaction is 0.2 into 5 that is 1% and front sector b will be minus 0.2 into 15 that is minus 3% so the total allocation selection interaction comes out to be minus 2% so if we add this we would be able to completely explain our value added return we can say 4% we lost because of picking the wrong sectors 10% we gained because of picking the right stocks and 2% we lost in the allocation selection interaction that is because we were overweighting and picking stocks everything cannot be explained purely by these two matrix so 2% was lost in the interaction between allocation and selection giving an excess return of 4% so generally speaking if you understand the logic you would not need to remember the formula you will be able to derive and implement the formula directly however if you are finding it too difficult to understand the logic then you can try to remember the formula also remember the allocation selection interaction term doesn't have so much of interpretive significance it is just the remainder needed to make the value added return equal to the calculated amount so weight of the sector in the portfolio minus the weight of the sector in the benchmark into the return of the sector in the benchmark minus the return on the benchmark is my sector allocation is a sector call worked or not weight of the portfolio in the benchmark into the return weight of the sector in the benchmark into the return of the sector in my portfolio minus the return of the sector in the benchmark is pure stock selection did we pick the right stocks the remaining amount is the allocation selection interaction this will normally be a much smaller number i have a a pretty vivid benchmark normal benchmark will not be there there'll be many sectors there'll be smaller weights so this allocation selection interaction will be a much lower number it is the weight of the sector in the portfolio minus the weight of the sector in the benchmark multiplied by the return of the sector in the portfolio minus the return of the sector in the benchmark we'll do a detailed example and try to revise and understand these concepts once again one of the investment managers of the gigs fund has the following results of a micro attribution analysis the weights in the portfolio are given the weights in the benchmark are given the return of the sector in the portfolio is given the return of the sector in the benchmark is given using data from the figure calculate the performance impact due to financial sector allocation so please note it is only the sector allocation impact that is asked don't be over enthusiastic and calculate anything excess just because you know so we have to only give the sector allocation impact now we put a weight of 18.53 when the benchmark weight was 16.56 so we overweight the financial sector whereas 
the benchmark return of the financial sector was 2.22% and the overall benchmark return was only 0.56%. So it's a good thing we overweight a sector that performed better. So 18.53 minus 16.56 into 2.22 minus 0.56 so we can take this in decimals and keep this in percentage so the overall return will be in percentage will come out to be 0.0327 percent for the same data the next question asks us to calculate the utilities within sector allocation return or other within sector selection return so within sector means stock selection what is the additional return that we got from stock selection in the utilities sector or the within sector allocation of utilities so utilities have a weight of 7.12 percent in the benchmark when calculating the within sector allocation or stock selection impact we use the weight in the benchmark for this weight in our portfolio we got a return of 0.54 percent whereas the benchmark gave a return of minus 0.42 percent so our utilities did better to the extent of about 0.96 percent on a weight of 7 percent that is 0 0.0712 into 0.54 minus 0.42 will be the within sector allocation of utilities that will be equal to 0.0684 percent finally let's try to calculate the allocation selection interaction return for consumer durables So allocation selection interaction is given as weight in the portfolio minus the weight in the benchmark multiplied by the return of the sector in the portfolio minus the return of the sector in the benchmark for consumer durables this product will come out to be 0.00023% we can see that the return is quite similar hence it's not a significant number so please note the difference between the portfolio return and the benchmark return will come out if you sum up all the three that is the sector allocation the within sector allocation that is the stock selection and the allocation selection interaction for all sectors then you will be able to explain this difference just like we did in our example earlier another method of performing the attribution analysis is referred to as fundamental factor attribution so in the fundamental factor attribution we don't look at individual sectors or individual stocks rather with the regression type analysis we try to identify the fundamental factors that generate systemic returns so let's assume for the benchmark we have derived that the benchmark return is highly dependent on the GDP growth it is highly dependent on inflation and to some extent dependent on the P by E multiple that the stocks have so if we construct a portfolio that has the same factor sensitivities then essentially we would be replicating the portfolio or rather replicating the benchmark we can deviate from the benchmark if we think that GDP growth is going to surprise or inflation is going to surprise negatively so our portfolio may be more sensitive to GDP growth so our portfolio has a sensitivity of 0.7 to GDP growth or a sensitivity of 0.9 to P by E multiple depending on our view and the attribution then would be the difference in exposures that caused a return so if GDP actually grew 
then our return will be better. If GDP degrew or there was a negative return, then our return would be worse than the benchmark. So, with fundamental factor attribution, we try to explain our returns depending on what weighting we chose to keep to the fundamental factors versus what weightings did the benchmark have on the fundamental factors. So, determine first the exposures of the portfolio and the benchmark to the fundamental factors at the start of the evaluation period. How will you do it? A regression type analysis, see the returns on the benchmark, see the returns on the various fundamental factors and try to derive these betas or these sensitivities. The benchmark could be the risk exposure of a style or a custom index or a set of normal factor exposures that are typical of the manager's portfolio. So, this could even be one of the factors here could be the large cap index. So, the return on the benchmark may be dependent on the large cap index and the return on the portfolio may also be dependent on the large cap index. Determine the manager's active exposure. That is the difference between his normal exposures or the benchmark exposures and his actual exposures. And then determine the active impact. So, this is the return added due to active exposures. So, this is another way of doing attribution which will be completely different from your selection allocation attribution that we did earlier. Let us see the advantages and disadvantages of the two approaches. So, in micro attribution we disaggregate the performance between sectors and securities which is relatively easy to calculate. In fundamental factors, we identify factors other than just security selection or sector allocation. So, on the overall portfolio, we see what is the exposure to various fundamental factors and try to see whether the portfolio was overweighting or underweighting these as compared to the benchmark. The, limita the limitation here is the need to identify an appropriate benchmark with specified securities and weights at the start of the evaluation period. Security selection decisions will affect sector weighting, hence there will be a part that you will not be able to explain called the allocation selection interaction. This is a disadvantage that that 2 percent why it came or where is difficult to explain. Exposures to the factors need to be determined at the start of the period for the fundamental factor model and this itself can be quite complex because the whole regression analysis need to be done with historical values for all the fundamental factors to first judge which actually is a fundamental factor that is affecting the performance and which factors are not because there will be so many fundamental factors that can potentially impact the portfolio. So, spurious correlations can be there and misinterpretations are more likely in the fundamental factor model attribution. We will next try to understand the micro attribution for fixed income portfolios. Just like equity portfolios outperformed, even fixed income portfolios may have outperformed or underperformed a particular benchmark. And now we will try to see what were the reasons that that happened. Generally speaking, a big part of fixed income outperformance will come because of interest rate management. That is because you kept a duration different than that of the benchmark. So, if the benchmark had a duration of 5 and you kept a duration of 8 and the interest rates went down, then you will outperform. And if interest rates went up, you would underperform. This is called the interest rate management effect. Generally, a very big part of any fixed income portfolio's outperformance. So, how do we calculate this effect is value each security like a treasury and deduct the return on treasuries over the holding period. So, this is the additional return given to or given to interest rate management. So, because of credit spread increase or because of our sectors performing, the, I bought bonds of steel sector. The steel sector performed well is not what I am trying to capture here. I am only trying to cal capture the interest rate management 
effect. So value each of the bonds or value each of the securities like a treasury security for both your portfolio as well as the benchmark and then deduct the return of treasuries over the holding period that is the additional return that you got because of interest rate management. You could have gotten additional return because of sector or quality management as well. So you invested in sectors that performed better. Even in bonds, you took bonds of sectors that performed better or you took credit ratings that performed better. So AAA rated bonds performed better than AA rated bonds or the credit spread expanded hence B rated C rated bonds underperformed. That could also be a reason why you could give an excess return over and above the benchmark. So the bonds are valued using the treasury rates plus an average risk premium for the bond. So the average risk premium is what the benchmarks valuation would be for this bond. Our return could be higher than the return calculated by the average risk premium because the risk premium of our portfolio may not be as high for the fact that we chose good quality bonds and we chose bonds for whom the credit spread did not expand as much. So the difference between let's assume that the value of your of our portfolio to begin with was $10 and $5 can be explained because of the duration impact that is if nothing happened to credit spreads and no change happened for any other reason just because of our duration call we would have earned $5 additional over and above the duration call because we were in better sectors we earned $2 additional so the value of our portfolio at the end would have all effects would be $17 because of duration as well as credit spread or betterment in spread so $2 can be attributable to sector and quality management some return additionally could come because not only did we pick the right sector within the sector also we picked the right bond so steel bonds or steel sector on the whole did well or triple A rated bonds or triple A rating did well as compared to other ratings and within triple A rating the SBI bonds performed better than any other triple A rated bond or within the steel sector Tata steel bonds performed better than any other steel bonds. So this is the extent to which the bonds actual price was better than the sectors average return. So an additional $1 may come because of picking the right bond or picking the right security within AAA rated category or within a particular category. Again, there will be some part that will not be explained, which we will call the trading effect. So this is the part of the outperformance that we are unable to explain or unable to clearly ascribe to any one of these factors. How it is actually calculated will not be asked, but generally speaking, you can understand value like a treasury for interest rate management effect ignore credit effects and in ignore so value the portfolio also like the treasury value the benchmark also like the treasury like assuming there is no credit risk and then calculate the difference that difference will be pure interest rate management for sector quality management see the average spread on the sectors or see the average spread on all sectors combined versus the average spread in your portfolio or your sectors if your sector's average spread is lower as compared to the average spread of all sectors in the benchmark, then you have outperformed by picking better sectors because the average spread is lower or the value of your portfolio will be higher. 
if the spread on your bonds is lower than the spread or the average spread on the sector then not only have you picked the right sector but you've picked the right bond within that sector also because the spread on your bond went further down or performed better than that sector as well and that will give you the return on security selection or the security selection effect whatever is remaining if any will be because of timing or for unexplained reasons we will call it the trading effect we'll understand better with an example the figure below outlines the performance attribution analysis for two fixed income managers of the helix fund for the year ended december 31st 2010 had a total interest rate effect of 1.22% beta also had a total interest rate effect of 1.22% and the benchmark also had 1.22% that is there was an expected increase in yields to the extent of 0.56 and there was an unexpected increase to the extent of 0.66 this yield increase would have had different impacts on different portfolios depending on the duration that they kept so because of interest rate management and because we probably kept a lower duration or alpha kept a lower duration there was a positive 0.18 percent impact for beta there was a negative 0.17 percent impact over and above the benchmark so whatever impact this interest rate increase had on the benchmark the impact on alpha was lower to the extent of 0.18 because of better duration or that is lower duration than the benchmark and beta had a loss of 0.17 probably because of a higher duration than the benchmark because of convexity the impact was a negative 0 0.07 so the convexity of the portfolios was probably lower than the convexity of the benchmark for yield curve changes there was a positive impact of 0.8 and 0.1 our exposure was higher to the rates that moved favorably than the benchmark so we would probably have more cash flows coming on rates that moved favorably as compared to the benchmark so overall interest rate management had a positive impact of 0.21 percent a negative of 0 0.06 for alpha and beta respectively sector selection had a negative impact of 0 0.08 bond selection had positive 1.6 sector 1.17 for beta and negative 0.13 for beta on bond selection there were no transaction costs and trading activity active return was 0 0.09 0 0.1 that is the unexplained return as compared to the benchmark so overall the benchmark gave a return of 0.1.22 percent beta gave a return of 2.3 percent and alpha gave a return of 1.6 percent outperformance would be 1.6 minus 1.22 and 2.3 minus 1.22 alpha asset management states that its investment strategy is to outperform the index through active interest rate management and bond selection so we would like to see that has outperformance actually come from bond selection yes it has and interest rate management so we'll go and see the interest rate management that's also a positive point to one yes so alpha seems to be following its stated style and doing well at it if it was following its stated style but not doing well then both these would have been negative others should be zero if any other value is very big then we can say that he is deviating from his stated style if he is saying if he is claiming to be active interest rate management and bond selection that means not only should these be positive numbers the others should not be very high because we are not claiming to deviate much on the other aspects beta asset management 
states that the investment strategy is to immunize against interest rate exposure and to yield positive contribution through bond selection. So we see bond selection has a negative 0.13. Now this per se may not be a problem because calls can go right, calls can go wrong. The bigger problem is that we are seeing a big positive value coming from sector selection or sector picking. Hence, his strategy is not just of bond selection, it is also of sector selection. And similarly, we see a negative impact coming because of the duration effect and a total minus 0 0.06 on the interest rate management. The, the overall may not be very big, but we see there is significant deviation as compared to the cash flows of the benchmark or the timing of the cash flows because if we are immunizing then our cash flows should more or less be matching. That is this interest rate effect to such a big, if, big, big, big level should not be there. So we can argue that beta is probably deviating from his stated style and even his bond selection strategy is not yielding great results with a negative 0.13 percent. Assess whether both managers positive performances were primarily through their stated objectives. That's what you just assessed for alpha. Yes. For beta. No. When evaluating performance, it definitely makes sense to look at risk adjusted performance. So the performance metrics we've already studied in portfolio management at various levels will quickly revise them ex post alpha is also known as jensen's alpha is calculated as the return on the portfolio minus the capm dictated return that is rf plus beta times rm minus rf the ex post alpha jensen's alpha takes beta as the measure of risk Information ratio is simply the active return divided by the active risk or return on the portfolio minus the benchmark upon the volatility of the return on the portfolio minus the return on the benchmark. Trainer measure is the excess return to systematic risk or non-diversifiable risk will give us the same rankings as Jensen's alpha and calculated as return on the portfolio minus the return on the benchmark upon the beta of the, uh, minus the risk free rate upon the beta of the portfolio. The sharp ratio is the reward to variability that is the excess return return on the portfolio minus the risk free rate upon the total risk that is diversifiable plus undiversifiable risk. The M squared ratio or the The M squared ratio also uses standard deviation as a measure of risk and will give us the same rankings as the sharp ratio and is calculated as RF plus RP minus RF into sigma M upon sigma P. So RP minus RF upon sigma P is the sharp ratio. Multiply it with sigma M and add RF. This will be compared with the return on the market. If this is greater than the return on the market, then the portfolio will be said to have done a good job. If this is less than the return on the market, then the portfolio would have said to have done a bad job. So RP minus RF is the excess return on the portfolio. What is the risk that the portfolio took? Sigma P. What is the risk of the market? Sigma M. So plus RF or RM minus RF should be equal to RP minus RF into Sigma M upon Sigma P. That is for the risk that the portfolio has taken as against the risk that the market has. Has the portfolio generated more excess return or not? The M square ratio will give us the same ranking as the Sharpe ratio. The trainer ratio and the Jensen's alpha will also give us the same rankings. You cannot compare one ratio with the other. 
when calculating the risk adjusted performance you have to ensure you can use any of the ratios depending on what the situation is or depending on what you think is the most applicable definition of risk however you must compare the same ratio across different portfolios or across different stocks a trainer ratio cannot be compared with the m squared ratio or any combination like that the rest of the interpretations remain the same as they were at level 1 and level 2 the definitions of risk vary it can be argued which is the best definition of risk we studied earlier in risk management that we can also compute return on war return on capital return on maximum drawdown etc now the million dollar question often is that has the fund manager significantly added any return or are there significant value added returns for all fund managers if we evaluate performance there would be periods of outperformance or positive value added returns there would be periods of negative value added returns there would be periods of significant value added returns and there would be periods of significant underperformance also now how do we define that when are the value added returns significant or not so generally we will compute some confidence interval of the fund managers returns returns in excess of let's say two standard deviations or in excess of minus two standard deviations on the negative side would be significantly negative returns or significantly positive returns now when evaluating the fund manager the null hypothesis will be that there are no significant returns if we are able to reject this null hypothesis then we will imply the alternative that is the fund manager has given significant returns so what we do is we start with the assumption or we start with the null that the fund manager has not given any significant returns we can then calculate the returns that the manager historically has given that is the value added returns divided by the standard deviations of those returns minus 0 if we are able to reject this null hypothesis with the normal distribution assumption for instance that is if this comes out to be greater than 2 sigma or 2.33 sigma then we'll, we will conclude that yes the management has or the manager has given significant value added returns if we are unable to reject the null hypothesis then we will conclude that the manager has not given significant value added returns now when we do this calculation of course there is no foolproof way of testing whether he is a good fund manager or not this is a quantitative test and there can be qualitative parameters analysis of the portfolio the breakup of the securities etc at well as well but generally if we use this hypothesis and let's say reject the null hypothesis that is we conclude that there were significant returns and actually we find out from future performance that actually the fund manager was a bad fund manager that is the returns were not significant or in the future he actually underperformed that means we would have committed or we would have rejected a true null hypothesis or we would have committed a type 1 error if based on this analysis we were unable to reject the null and we concluded that the fund manager has given no significant returns then we would have 
fired the fund manager based on this analysis and then probably found out that actually he was a good fund manager it's just the period of evaluation wherein he did not perform well that is rejecting or rather failing to reject an incorrect null hypothesis this null hypothesis was incorrect there were no significant returns in this sample or in this period of evaluation but actually the fund manager is a good fund manager when he started his own fund and when he went to the other place we saw returns were actually quite good so we rejected or rather we failed to reject an incorrect null hypothesis or we can commit a type to error so concluding whether the fund manager has added value or not added value will generally be a tough thing to do we can make some assumptions we can have some quality control charts that is a positive performance of so many standard deviations will be considered to be significant or a negative performance of so much percentage points or so many standard deviations will be considered significantly negative but then again it is difficult to judge the quality of fund manager because of the limited data and because of the qualitative aspects that are involved in fund management so the null hypothesis remember will be that the manager adds no value and automatically the alternative would be the manager adds positive value the type 1 and type 2 errors that we will be susceptible to if we only use quantitative data to do analysis like this